Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, September 25th, 2019. Now, impeachment, even though we hear a lot of people talk about it from administration to administration, it's not something that actually happens real often in our day-to-day lives or even in our political conversations. So I don't think it's surprising that few people actually have even a basic understanding of it. So in this episode today, I'm going to do an introductory overview of impeachment with a focus primarily on what high misdemeanors actually are under the Constitution. First of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We're broadcasting live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio for the 10th Amendment Center. We have our live channels at uh, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, DLive, and Twitch. We have archived video versions at Brighteon.com, Brighteon, and BitChute.com. Plus, we have a podcast edition over at iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, and elsewhere. You can find all of our archives, all of the show notes, all the way to follow us. Uh, all the way to su- all the ways to subscribe, like getting email newsletters, subscribing as a member, and pitching in financially, over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. All spelled out. Tenthamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Saying hello over to the live chat. Everyone joining me. I really appreciate you guys. Denver Libertarian, Andrew Nappy, Patricia Dance, promote promote liberty. Cannabis heals me. Good to see you as well. Uh, plus Clay Davis, good to see you. Please continue to leave some comments, whether it's live or in the archive. This all, all these platforms are very easily triggered. So the more stuff that you do on them, it tells the algorithm whether you smash the like or leave a comment or share, whatever it may be. It tells the algorithm to show the program to more people. So while I love the uh, community commentary and the feedback. I also love the algorithm triggering that helps us get the word out. So hi to Justin Morrison as well. Appreciate you being here over on Facebook. So let's get into this. First of all, uh, over from Wikipedia, let me pull this up. There are four main sections of the Constitution addressing impeachment. The Constitution itself, impeachment is no minor thing. It mentions the word impeachment six times throughout the document, I believe is correct. And here... I'm just going to go through the different clauses, for example, that that focus on it. First, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5, it says the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment. In Article 1, Section 3, Clauses 6 and 7, the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. And again, it says judgment in cases of of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. There you go. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. That's in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, and Clause 7. Article 2, Section 2 also mentions impeachment. The president shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. So the founders thought impeachment was such a big deal, they didn't want a pardon for it. And then in Article 2, Section 4, the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Again, Article 2, Section 4. And I think it pretty most people are pretty clear on what a conviction for treason or bribery is, or at least they have a good general idea. Other high crimes and misdemeanors is a pretty confusing one for a lot of us. And then it's mentioned, that was five times. In Article 3, it mentions, I think it's Article 3, it mentions impeachment a uh, sixth time. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. The trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury. So you can't have a jury trial in impeachment. So that was really important, I think, as a general overview, just to go over where in the Constitution it actually mentions impeachment. Now, the framers of the Constitution didn't actually make up this process out of nowhere. It's not like 
the idea of impeachment started with the U.S. Constitution or the Constitution for the United States and had never existed before that. It wasn't just something that's brand new. There is a long history. And we have an article here that we published from my buddy Joe Wolverton. It was originally published over at the New American Magazine, which is run by JBS. And it's called The History of Impeachment. Again, this link will be in the show notes. I generally publish those about a half hour to an hour after the live broadcast is done. And he goes through the history, the long history, way back through the English history of impeachment. But I wanted to point out that it was also part of the state constitutions in force at the time of the convention in 1787. That's how Joe puts it in his article. In every state constitution in force at the time of the calling of the convention of 1787. So they all had this structure of government in mind for their states, at least as an example of either something that was working well or something that they wanted to get rid of when they went to the Philadelphia Convention. Joe points out that the lower branch of the legislature possessed the authority to impeach officers of the state government, though the trial of impeachment magist- of the impeached magistrate was handled differently in the several states. And there was debate about this as well. He says in Virginia and Maryland, the state courts tried the impeached. In New York and South Carolina, the state Senate and state judiciary joined together as a special court. In Pennsylvania, the General Assembly could impeach, and trials were conducted by the president of that body and an executive council. And he says in the remaining eight states, the upper branch of the state legislature was the body responsible for trying the impeached state official. That was the most common one, and it's very similar to what we have today. Now, going over to this interesting article from uh, Rob Nadelson that was run last year. I think we cross-posted this over on our site, but this is over uh, at the Independence Institute, i2i.org. What impeachment requires and why it wouldn't be wise for Dems to push it. You can read the whole thing. He does make some political points on why he thinks it's a bad strategy for Democrats, at least at that point in December. But let's get into a little bit more of the specifics rather than the current political climate that I think will be instructive. It starts out with the Constitution states that federal officials, quote, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The House has the power to impeach, which is the accusation. The Senate tries the case. He says, although a mere majority of the House is sufficient for impeachment, two-thirds must vote in the Senate for conviction. And one problem, Rob writes, the president's opponents face is that unless they can uncover specific instances of treason, bribery, or felony, they will have to rely on the president's alleged high crimes and misdemeanors. And he focuses primarily on high misdemeanors. And he thinks that's a political danger. Whether that is or not, I guess, is a different discussion than what we're covering here. Rob goes on to get into a little bit of what is meant by a high demeanor. Constitutional experts, he points out, agree that a high misdemeanor is much more serious than the petty offenses we commonly call misdemeanors today. So it's not the same as getting a misdemeanor uh, citation. It's a high misdemeanor. It's more serious. And he has a recent article that we're going to cover in Federalist Society Review. He explained that the Constitution uses the phrase high misdemeanor to mean a breach of fiduciary duty what the American founders called a breach of public trust. And well, it's real. a lot of it is kind of gray area, and I think that's probably why he was suggesting that it's politically filled with pitfalls. I also want to look at another friend here, her blog from back in 2013, Publius Holda. If you don't read Publius's work, I think a lot of it is extremely good. She's always been very supportive of our work. She spoke at one of our nullification events, and I'm grateful for this blog as well. Impeachment, all you need to know, and you do need to know it. And this was focused on the previous administration rather than the current one, but I think the the information is actually very general. She says, quote, it is not necessary, she put in all caps, not, it is not necessary that the president, other officers in the executive branch, or federal judges commit a crime before they may be impeached and removed from office. It doesn't have to be criminal. There's high crimes and misdemeanors, and she's leading into that as well. 
Federalist Paper Number 66, second paragraph, and Federalist Number 77, last paragraph, show that the president may be impeached and removed for encroachments. And you've heard me use this term like she does, usurpations of power. I use this regularly because this is the term that the founders regularly used. Usurpation is a serious offense against the Constitution. St. George Tucker at one point called usurpation treason against the sovereignty of the people. Usurpation, by definition, is taking and exercising power that doesn't belong to you. So under a public trust, a fiduciary duty, you are entrusting government people. And maybe that's a bad choice. Maybe that shouldn't even be a statement of trusting government people. Of course, you should never. But entrusting, I guess, in a legal sense, you're entrusting people with the power to, with the ability to exercise powers that have been delegated to them. And when they exercise powers that were not delegated to them, they are taking power that doesn't belong to them, taking power from the sovereign. The sovereign is the people of the several states. And that theft of power is a usurpation. Some founders and some leading legal experts in the founding generation thought of usurpation as treason in and of itself. I think it's a harder case to be made, and that is uh, another show in and of itself. But usurpation is a problematic thing, of course, in our day. And if it's if in, just as a side note, if impeachment can be based on usurpations of power, I think every president in at least in my lifetime, probably going back at least a century, if not to uh, uh, Lincoln and probably earlier, could all have been impeached. Whether there was the political will for that or not is another story. <clears throat> but she talks about usurpations of power, citing Federalist 66 and 77. Let's look at Federalist 66. Big government guy, Alexander Hamilton, March 11th, 1788. He writes this, an absolute or qualified in negative in the executive upon the acts of the legislative body is admitted by the ablest adepts in political science to be an indispensable barrier against the encroachments of the latter upon the former. Short, more modern version of that is having an unqualified veto power over the legislature gives the executive branch a check on the legislative power. But he also points out that the reverse is true. You have to have a reverse check as well. And he says it may perhaps with no less reason be contended that the powers relating to impeachments are, as before intimated, an essential check in the hands of that body upon the encroachments of the executive. So you've got checks both directions. The executive has veto power to check acts of the, of the legislature. That's one of the checks there. I think enforcement discretion, the willingness to not direct officers to enforce acts that the executive sees as unconstitutional is another check. Uh, but in this context, Hamilton is talking about back and forth and equal checks. So the, the executive branch has the check of veto and the legislative branch has the check of impeachment as well. But not just in Federalist 66 and 77. Here's also Federalist 65 talking about impeachment again. The subjects of its jurisdiction, he's talking about a court for the trial of impeachments and why, whether or not it should be the Senate. There is a debate over that because we know in the state constitutions it varied. So people came to the Philadelphia Convention and people once after the convention, there were discussions. Well, why is it so different than what we have in this state, for example? And I forget what it was in New York. That's interesting. So in New York, where so mind you, side note. The Federalist Papers were not written primarily for the full country. They were primarily written for an audience in New York State, where it was likely under the leadership of George Clinton, not the other George Clinton, but the leadership of the governor at the time in New York. They were leaning heavily towards rejecting ratification in New York. So these Federalist Papers from Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay Leading Federalist supporters of the Constitution were written in secret, written anonymously, in order to actually convince the general public, to convince the ratifying convention that it was okay to ratify the Constitution. So think about that. The context is important. So in New York, we know that, like in South Carolina, the state Senate and state judiciary joined together as a special court. So there was debate, probably, it makes sense, 
well, this is how we do it here in New York. Why do we want it differently? Why do we not want the judiciary involved in this? And there was a certain, uh, certain concern about that. But Hamilton was addressing this to the citizens of New York. And it actually says at the start of all these Federalist Papers, to the people of the state of New York. I believe it's in almost every one. It starts out with that exact phrase. So he talks about this. Who's going to try Try the impeachment. He says the subjects of its jurisdiction are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. And that goes back to what Rob was saying earlier, a fiduciary duty, a public trust passed along to people to manage the government, basically. They are of a nature, Hamilton writes, which may be may with peculiar well. Usually I read in my head, so I apologize when I read out loud and I stumble. They are of a nature which may, with peculiar propriety, be denominated political. And he puts political. For those of you who are just listening, political is in all caps. And that means he's putting some emphasis. This is political nature. As they chiefly, as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. There you go. So we're talking about political high crimes and misdemeanors. So that's Federalist Papers 66 and 65. Let's go back to what Rob says in this other uh, article that we ran, his short blog, Impeachment. What did the founders mean by high misdemeanors? He starts out by saying, several years ago, while researching the subject for my book, the original Constitution, what it actually said and meant, I have not uh, looked at the most recent version of that in a while, but I always loved the second edition, which taught me a lot on at least how to read a lot of the things in there. But he says, I reviewed all the historical evidence I could. I became convinced that high misdemeanors are what we now call breaches of fiduciary duty. The founders, he writes, had a variety of names for that concept. Although I reported some of the evidence in my book, I've now published in more complete form. Fiduciary duties. What does this mean? What did the founders actually say about these types of things? Well, these duties, quote, are a set of well-established obligations a person has when managing the interests of others. And that's basically what Hamilton was saying in the Federalist Papers here. This, Now, mind you, Hamilton was just junk. <laughs> I mean, he was a flip-flopper. He made the case for the Constitution in advance and then did everything he could to come up with legal justifications afterward to twist it and expand power. So we do have to take it with a grain of salt. But in areas where there wasn't a lot of rejection of these views and it actually goes in line with many others, I should have probably pulled up other other statements on this. But I think this is pretty representative of what they thought of, uh, of as a reason for impeachment. So fiduciary obligations, Rob continues, include honesty, good faith, loyalty towards those they work for, following instructions, reasonable care, treating those they work for impartially, and presenting accounts of what they have done. So this is what is basically, that's your job. I mean, your job is to follow your oath to the Constitution, and there are reasonable differences when people are focusing on the Constitution. See, you can throw away a lot of this based on what happens today because no one follows the Constitution. It's not even close. So at some point it's moot, but we do want to start with the foundation. The foundation being what did the founders intend here? And Rob goes on, he says, the founders were committed to furthering fiduciary government to the extent reasonable and practical. So they included high misdemeanors as a way to remove officers who, while not perhaps not guilty of crimes, have been dishonest, disloyal, overly biased, or negligent. But an officer is not impeachable merely for mistakes in policy or reasonable disagreements over interpretation of the law. So that is important stuff. We can go back to this article that Rob wrote, and I want to focus not necessarily on the entire thing, because he goes through some of the history in English law of impeachment as well, which formed a lot of the legal understanding that the founders had and the, the ratifying general public. 
but instead look at the 18th, uh, 18th century American sources section, which focuses primarily on statements made by founders and ratifiers. Rob goes on in this article, he says, leading participants in the drafting and ratification of the Constitution regularly connected impeachment with fiduciary violations. At the federal convention, James Madison argued that an impeachment procedure for the president was necessary because, quote, and this is what James Madison had to say in the convention, it was indispensable that some provision should be made for defending the community against the incapacity, negligence, or perfidy of the chief magistrate. Incapacity, negligence, or perfidy. What's perfidy? If you were to look this up in a dictionary of the time, maybe Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, early 1790s, late 1780s, mid to late, I think 1785 might be an edition that you could look it up. I would think that perfidy, at least from what I've read in the past, is basically willful corruption and abuse of power. Perfidy. So Madison is talking about three reasons to have this impeachment power. Incapacity, because they can't do their job. Negligence, or corruption and abuse of power. He goes on, he might lose his capacity after his appointment. He might pervert his administration into a scheme of peculation or oppression. He might betray his trust to foreign powers. Now, Governor Morris, who was actually opposed to the process at first— and this is a real big government guy as well. We all focus on Hamilton, but guys like Morris, James Wilson, even Madison were really big centralized power supporters. Madison ended up supporting the Federalist structure because he, he wanted to support the end result rather than what his personal preferences were. But Morris then added he was, quote, now sensible of the necessity the president may be bribed by a greater interest to betray his trust. That was his reason to be supportive of this uh, particular part of the Constitution, this power. Charles, Coatwork, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney in South Carolina said that impeachment would be available for federal officers who, quote, behave amiss or betray their public trust. Exact same phrase that uh, Hamilton used in Federalist 65. There we go. I guess I did have a quote on that. And his ally, Edward Rud Rutledge, made a similar statement in the same context. In the Virginia Ratifying Convention, where we have a lot of the greats of the greats that people know, Edmund Randolph saw it as a remedy for dishonesty, disloyalty, and self-dealing. George Nicholas and James Madison. Nicholas helped introduce or helped support the Virginia Resolutions of 1798 some years later referred to it as a remedy for maladministration and violating the nat national interest. These are really broad terms. Patrick Henry as a response to violation of duty. I don't think we give enough credit to Patrick Henry and his warnings, and I've made it one of my own goals to study him more closely, but he was really on top of it with a lot of things. He saw impeachment for a violation of duty. And again, that goes back to my statement. Every modern president should have been impeached or should be impeached because the, their duty, their only duty, is to follow the Constitution. And every day that they allow things like mass warrantless surveillance or the Gun Control Act of 1968 to be enforced under their watch or they participate in that enforcement, they are violating their oath, period. So we get a lot of people talking about this, a lot of leading founders talking about this being a, a violation of public trust, a violation of duty. Here's back to Publius Hulda again. She says, the meaning of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors in Article 2, Section 4 is broader than one might at first glance think. Somewhere, she says, I saw a scholarly paper showing that the high refers to the status of the official. I wish she would have linked to that. Maybe she... I don't see a footnote. I'll have to dig in there, maybe email her and find out. It does not refer to the severity of the defense. Now, note well, she says, misdemeanor has a broader meaning than a lesser category of criminal offense. And even though she uses this dictionary, I know a lot of people seem to do this. I do not. I actually reject the idea of using Webster's 1828 dictionary for the definition because this is so much further. 
if you're really past the mid-1790s, you aren't talking about a definition of a word that influenced the thought process of the founders, the framers in Philadelphia, or the ratifiers in the state ratifying conventions. So thinking 1828, it could be right if the dictionaries earlier said the same thing. But it is interesting nonetheless. The Webster's 1828 dictionary shows the primary meaning of misdemeanor as ill behavior, evil conduct, fault, and mismanagement. She writes, this shows that a president, vice president, and all civil officers and judges of the United States may be impeached, tried, convicted, and removed from office for mismanagement. That's pretty hardcore. Now, this was uh, at the time where the previous president was in office, and I think she was encouraging people like, look, this is this is a way to go. This is what you can do to deal with this. Now, we've heard this from about every modern president. There's, I, I remember in the anti-war days when there were actually anti-war activists on the left, when Bush was in office, one of the big things, there was a big website at the time, or well-trafficked one, impeachbush.org. I don't think it's up anymore, maybe, uh, but there was a lot of a lot of push for that around 2006, 2007 or so, but it never materialized. But this is always some kind of a talk. And she references, look, you can be removed from office for mismanagement. If we have the proper understanding of mismanagement, mismanagement is a violation of the oath. That's maladministration in my view. Now, keep in mind that when we look at Madison's notes on the convention, and they weren't released till much later, we do learn that George Mason actually tried to add the word maladministration. If you look through the record, we learn that George Mason at one point tried to list, so it would have been um, treason, bribery, etc., or maladministration. That's what it was going to be, or that's what George Mason wanted it to be. But Madison objected to that. He said it was so vague a term, it will be equivalent to a tenure daring pleasure of the Senate. So vague a term that it will be equivalent to a tenure daring pleasure of the Senate. So then George Mason substituted high crimes and misdemeanors for maladministration. The convention approved that, and that's what we're working with now today. Here's how Nadelson sums it up, and I think it makes up. Again, there's a lot of gray area in this, but I hope that this is at least uh, at least a little bit educational for you as well. Rob puts it this way, we best capture the meaning of the phrase high misdemeanors when we think of it as referring to breaches of fiduciary duty. And let me look at this on fiduciary duty again. Where did I pull this up? Honesty, good faith, loyalty towards those they work for, following instructions, reasonable care, treating those they work for impartially, and presenting accounts of what they have done. I would say, the o- for me, the only thing is following the oath of office, following the Constitution. But, you know, maybe I'm old-fashioned on that. But again, he sums it up. High misdemeanors are not limited to, and let me see if I can pull this up here. High misdemeanors are not limited to commission of crimes, but they do not include mere political differences. So if you're just disagreeing and having a political uh, infight, you're not supposed to impeach. Mind you, you may have the votes to do it, but that's not what it's there for. Just having the votes to do something doesn't mean it's right. And view of the majority does not make something moral either. Rob goes on, while violations of the criminal law provide grounds for impeachment, high misdemeanors encompass breaches of the duties of loyalty, good faith and care, and of the obligations to account and to follow instructions, including the law and constitution, when administering one's office. It's not an easy topic at all because there was some lack of clarity It is kind of the whole concept is very gray area to us. And I think in many ways it does become a political question. Uh, Like when Hamilton said, these are of a nature which with, again, I can't read this. They are of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be be denominated political. That's from Federalist 65. Again, political but not mere political differences, because that's not a high enough bar to mean high crimes 
and misdemeanors. Again, I hope you guys are finding this educational and interesting. I think it's an incredibly interesting uh, example. Shane Lackey makes a good point over on YouTube. He says, Obamacare was not passed in good faith. And if you go back to Rob's article, I will put this in my show notes links. He actually talks about that specifically. Look, the political problem that they will face for trying to impeach on grounds of high misdemeanors, not acting in good faith of office, is that it is very easy for opponents of that to make the case that Obamacare specifically was not taking care to follow the Constitution. This is good faith, and it's a real problem. And so he has this whole section. I'm not going to get get into it in detail, but I do encourage you to read this. He says, an enactment in 2010 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the ACA or Obamacare, provides a rich store of examples. He says, the political difficulty for the Democratic House is if it tries to impeach the president on these grounds— its conduct fell far short of fiduciary standards when they held the House as well. So there's going to be a charge of hypocrisy, and I think that charge should be absolutely correct. Unless you have the standard, like I do, not to say that I'm the the the, the standard bearer on this, but I think if we're looking to the founders for our guide, the standard should be following the Constitution. The fact that the Federal Reserve exists and every modern president is trying to push it around and manipulate it to, for their political goals and political ends, this is not having a fiduciary duty to their oath of office whatsoever. So every moment that that exists is an impeachable uh, offense. Exactly. So that's an, a very, very good point, Shane, because that's exactly where this article goes. And again, I do encourage you to read that in full. The title is what impeachment requires and why it wouldn't be wise for Dems to push it. Because without a specific instance of treason, bribery, or felony, then they're having to rely on something that their own team does all the time. And if they're opening this up, I think what they're doing is they're opening the, the door for originalists, constitution supporters like us, people who support liberty, to start making a stronger case for that against the next president. So when Elizabeth Warren comes in, or whoever, Biden, whatever, I think it's going to uh, cause them their own problems. It's political shooting themselves in the foot. And Rosie Hoyer says Democrats are on the path to implosion. I think, so Republicans, they're, they're both on the path to implosion because they're both horrible to the Constitution. But if you're talking about political choice and what's going to be successful, I don't know. I don't know. I know in the grassroots there is a lot of support among some people for this, but uh, that's that's different. Shane says Obamacare is not a reasonable interpretation of the law. Uh, Chris Branco, I'm glad you mentioned this. Raul Berger has a great book on impeachment. Berger wrote probably one of the best books ever on impeachment. He also wrote one of the best books on uh, government called Government by Judiciary. He's passed away. A great researcher. Uh, I think it was 1973 that he wrote this book on impeachment. And one of the flaws that I think in Berger's book, even though it's fantastic, is that it focused more on the historical use and it didn't have as much research on the founders' own experience when they were drafting this under the state constitutions. And I may be wrong on that, but that's my memory. It is an excellent book. Uh, let me see if I can find the title of that thing because that is Berger Impeachment. The book is titled Impeachment, the Constitutional Problems. I'm even finding a free PDF when I Google this. It was 1974. So I do encourage you guys, if you want a, a book-length treatment, that's probably the way to go. Uh, let me look again back to the live chat. Again, thanks for pointing that out. A lot of people talking about the UN speech. I saw some clips of it. EHP training says smash that button. How many watching versus smashing? Oh, and Shane Lackey says the Federal Reserve. I think we're uh, thinking along the same lines on a lot of this stuff. Says that the Federal Reserve is an example of usurpation. Oh, and for those of you who are in the YouTube chat, I want to just give a heads up. I know uh, many of you have chatted with Tyler B. Uh, over the last year or so. Tyler's going in for another surgery. It's his 25th. Hopefully when he gets a chance to uh, have his quick recovery and back at home and he's listening to this through the archives, he knows we all wished him well on a quick recovery. So, uh, Tyler, we're definitely thinking about you as well. Scott says, Bill was impeached but wasn't removed from office. And from my understanding, the closest that anyone was, uh, at least in the executive branch, for the president, 
The only one who ever was out of office was Richard Nixon. Uh, the impeachment process didn't actually remove him. It was a political process. He chose to resign rather than face that. So usurpation is a favored tool of tyrants. Spot on, says Chris Reitman. And usurpation is treasonous in my view. So I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you guys found it educational. There's a lot. This is really just scratching the surface. And when I put in the title that this is an introduction to uh, high crimes and misdemeanors, primarily high misdemeanors, it really is an introduction because you really have to dig in further to the ratification debates to have a really good understanding. I gave you guys a good overview. I think Nadelson's article covers this pretty well. We're learning things from people like George Nicholas, James Madison, Patrick Henry, Edmund Randolph, Charles Co Coatsworth Pinckney, the debate between Morris and Madison and Mason, so we can understand what their intention, uh, the Federalist Papers, this idea of violating the public trust. And again, my view, in short, is that every federal officer Everyone who takes an oath to the Constitution is violating that oath today. Everyone who's doing it, they are violating it at some point. And I think those who are directing the enforcement of all federal laws on the books are trying to, they can't do it because there's no way to have the resources or the manpower, are clearly violating their oath. So no one, I think, is really pushing that narrative. Now, if the leadership who is pushing the narrative of impeachment today, and you could listen to this in 10 years, and the leadership who's pushing impeachment in 10 years of that sitting president are probably also not going to be taking that position, that we want to take a new stand, that the Constitution needs to be followed every issue, every time, no exceptions, no excuses, and as soon as you start enforcing stuff that shouldn't be enforced, uh, then you need to get out of there. That's not happening. So it really is very political in nature, uh, but it is important to understand the basics. Anyways, again, I hope you guys found this really interesting and educational. I appreciate everyone spending some time here, and of course, all the good people who are uh, sending prayers and love to uh, Tyler, like EHP and Shane and others. I'm sure he's going to appreciate that as well. He's a really good dude. He's been very supportive of us. Hope you have a great Wednesday. Thanks again for joining me on this show. Smash the like, subscribe, leave some comments. Feel free to email me if you've got some ideas for shows in the future. Team at 10th Amendment Center .com. And if you want to kick in two bucks a month, that's you can go as little as two bucks a month. It's 10th Amendment Center .com slash members. That's how you support us. Thanks again for joining me. Have an awesome day. We'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.